It's been an incredible year celebrating uh, the one year anniversary of Linux Foundation in Europe. The community has grown. Uh, we formed four new projects. Uh, those projects have grown. Uh, one of the exciting announcements that came out this week was um, the fact that Microsoft has joined the Open Wallet Foundation. This is your host, Sopin Bhartia, and we are here at Open Source Summit in Bilbao, Spain. And today we have with us once again, Hilary Carter, SVP of Research and Communications at the Linux Foundation. Hilary, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you very much for having me, Swap. It's my pleasure to have you. Nice background here, right? It's beautiful. Bilbao is stunning. Such a pleasant surprise. I had no idea what to expect. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's just a fun event. So let's now talk about uh, the some of the kind of major announcement that you folks made uh, at this event. Uh, there are a lot of research, some reports came out. So let's start there. One of the um, important topics that bridges the last conversation that you and I had at Open Source Summit North America, Vancouver, was talking about um, our work, which was forthcoming for launch in Bilbao at Open Source Summit Europe, specific to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, on Sunday, the 17th of September, Jim Zemlin was speaking at the UN uh, at an event uh, led by uh, ITU and um, essentially describing the opportunity for open source software to be embraced as a digital public good that would help accelerate the UN SDGs. And on the 14th of September, we, were, we published a comprehensive report about the various ways that Linux Foundation projects and um, communities of practice uh, line up uh, with the objectives of uh, digital public goods and the sustainable development goals and hope that more uh, people all over the world, more governments, uh, more enterprises really leverage the opportunities that open source uh, creates, especially when it comes to sustainability. And none of these opportunities is greater than in the reduction of waste. And there's no need to rebuild architecture. Uh, we had, we of course have an entire uh, stream at Open Source Summit uh, that is Sustainability Con. And I had the opportunity to both listen in on panels uh, this week um, that were talking about different project communities and participate in another one uh, for LF Energy. And uh, really, it's just, I think that this messaging is so important about the impact. Of our, of our projects, uh, some created with the very specific goals of, uh, of meeting net zero targets and uh, creating energy efficient infrastructure, and others that enable the goals in um, uh, an, an indirect way. And it was just really a fascinating journey, and I hope that uh, our community broadly downloads the research, reads the report, discovers um, the opportunities to get involved, and ultimately spreads the word. Uh, in 2017, the UN Digital Compact, which is a, 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 an agreement among businesses to um, uh, accelerate uh, the objectives of the United Nations, and even then they recognized that open source was a critical part of uh, achieving the 2030 agenda. But it needs to be restated. It needs, that message needs to get out. So I hope if we've done one thing for the good of people and planet this week through Sustainability Con and through the publication of our report and through Jim's speaking at the UN is the reminder that open source is a vital part of this infrastructure and it's an accelerator. Will it be wrong to say that open source, of course, code, software is important, but it's more about collaboration is more about building a community is more about you know engaging because uh, Linux Foundation I don't want to like say just because I'm talking to you I've been covering this industry for so long you folks actually paved path for a lot of folks who would you would never see in the same room you know bring them together also made open source comfortable for corporate users. I mean, look at the large corporate members, you know, they are not only leveraging open source, they are contributing to it. So you folks have got, you know, corporate users to understand. Let's also talk about the public sector because they play a big role. And we are here in Europe where, you know, a lot of grassroots movements with open source actually started in Europe. Kernel came from here. MySQL came from Europe, Finland, both of them. But um, I have not seen the same kind of movement 
that we have seen in the United States, you know, by the inspiration, they came up with, you know, the whole S-bomb thing and open source. And also one or two weeks ago, there was a meeting there once again. Here we are not seeing that much there. So can you also talk about how Linux Foundation can help the public sector, not only just in the Europe, but globally also? They do understand the value, but they don't know the right process for it. That's right. And I, I think it begins with, first of all, providing um, preliminary uh, examples uh, and uh, providing the the tools and the resources and the background material, some of the examples of how this has been done in other sectors, as well as articulating what are the uh, sectors in Europe specifically, which have led in open source collaboration. And there is a strong case to be made that if Europe wants to meet its objectives of creating um, a digital independence, digital sovereignty, uh, um, reducing vendor lock-in, creating opportunities by Europeans for Europeans, that open source is the pathway to that. And research is an important part of that um, how-to. Uh, last year in Dublin at Open Source Summit Europe, there was a call to action to say, we need more research, we need more tools and, and broader understanding to even begin the conversations. And that's what we try to do with the LF Research Program is to put a stake in the ground using data, using um, uh, empirical findings, whether it's survey data or qualitative insights that provide the evidence to open those conversations and to begin that very important collaboration. Uh, one thing that we are finding in Europe that there are there is a degree of maturity here where, where open source is concerned. Um, there are innovative municipalities who are, um, you know, increasingly software defined, where uh, municipal public services, whether it's paying for, for a parking spot or um, uh, riding public transit, you know, community-driven initiatives, there's a lot of innovation there. And what can we learn from innovation that's already taking place in Europe? And how do we apply that up to higher levels of government, to regional governments and to national governments? And also through research, identifying who is leading in the public sector transformation. There are leaders. We just need to do a little bit more investigative work to find them. We've been able to identify them in energy here in Europe with um, RTE in France and Oliander in the Netherlands collaborating in the energy sector. Um, we just need to uncover uh, those examples of where there, there is leadership in open source in the public sector. We can see a kind of leadership coming out of Germany through the Sovereign Tech Fund and their investment in the OpenJS Foundation to the tune of 875,000 euros. That's leadership. Um, but where are those other examples and what are the obje objectives and what can other constituents learn in this region about how to get involved and what are the steps necessary? I think resourcing is one of the most Im important steps, but also showing up um, being present at Open Source uh, Summit Europe and and getting involved in in action. Right, and you mentioned uh, sustainability. You also mentioned RT and Aliander. And when we look at the Paris Accord, when you look at you know LFE is very well you know placed, and uh, RT and Aliander led that you know movement there. And now we also have Linux Foundation Europe. Uh, so. Can you also talk a bit about some of the work that you folks are doing in Europe? Uh, Lens from Europe was announced almost a year ago in Dublin. So also give us an update and you know the involvement with the public sector or the progress that the foundation has made here. It's been an incredible year celebrating uh, the one year anniversary of Linux Foundation in Europe. The community has grown. Uh, we formed four new projects. Uh, those projects have grown. Uh, one of the exciting announcements that came out this week was um, the fact that Microsoft has joined the Open Wallet Foundation. Um, a, a few weeks prior, we announced that Google had joined the Open Wallet Foundation. This is a really amazing um, signal that uh, the digital wallet uh, has a strategic role to play in the European payment ecosystem and that the door is open for other uh, uh, organizations to get involved. We would like to see uh, the public sector involved in a digital wallet conversation because 
so many citizen centric um, elements are present in our physical wallet. We have driver's licenses, we have identity cards, we have health cards, and those are elements that should be stored in an interoperable wallet no matter which country we're from, uh, no, no matter which type of device we use. And so, the, you know, Open Wallet Foundation uh, poised uh, for growth with the support of major organizations, what, regardless of the fact of whether those organizations are domiciled, sends a really healthy signal um, that this is a community that has caught the attention of some significant players, and uh, we want everybody to get involved. Now, since we're talking about Euro, there's one more thing I want to talk about, which is not that great, not that uh, positive, which is the Cyber Resiliency Act. There are a lot of concerns. Uh, intentions are good, but I think there was a lot of miscommunication between the actual open source communities and the lawmakers. Yeah. So can you talk about uh, uh, Cyber Resiliency Act and what Linux Foundation or Linux Foundation Europe or the community can do to kind of help lawmakers actually understand how open source really works? We launched a campaign this week, hashtag fix the CRA. And it is an absolute call to action. It is a plea to action for European organizations, European enterprises to get involved, to express to their members of European Parliament that this legislation written in the way it is written is utterly harmful for Europe. We had con so in addition to joining the campaign, in addition to raising your voices, contacting your members of European Parliament, clicking to tweet, um, raise the alarm bells because the conversations that we have had in the hallway tracks here from European organizations have, have simply been that our members of European Parliament do not understand the extent to which this is going to cause job loss. This is going to utterly stall um, uh, progress for Europe's uh, thriving ecosystem. And, and it's going to stall digital sovereignty. It's going to force um, companies to become more reliant on software developed elsewhere that it, where the developers are not subject to some of the harmful terms of the CRA. Uh, so. Uh, absolutely, it's been our core message this week is to get involved in, in creating awareness that the CRA, the way it is written, is incredibly uh, harmful. I also want to talk about one of the hottest topics these days is generative AI. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, you've worked on some reports. Talk a bit about what work you folks are doing uh, from your research division on generative AI. We uh, there's, it's obviously the most uh, uh, talked about uh, technology at this conference, and for good reason. You know, it's it's disruptive, it's transformative, and um, there is a there's a need to keep um, AI open. Uh, and there are a lot of voices who believe that to the contrary, and we have to understand the state of play. And one of, the re one of the ways we do this is also through research, of course. Uh, we launched a survey this week on generative AI. And uh, we need to understand to what extent organizations are using generative AI, to what, under, uh, to what extent uh, they're deriving value from generative AI, to what extent they believe that, that generative AI needs to be open uh, we need to understand their concerns, um, and so we're we're really excited to have that insight, to get a baseline understanding of the ecosystem, and to inform uh, our approach uh, with respect to potential regulation. To try to get ahead of it, to say, open. Uh, you know, our message is that we believe that AI will be a more trusted technology by way of its openness. And that's the message that uh, we're hoping uh, will come through loud and clear that is supported by empirical data. And that's why we launched the, re uh, the research uh, study during Ibrahim Haddad's keynote. It is in partnership with LF AI and Data and um, really, really an important area for uh, society at large. Hilary, thank you so much for taking time out today and, of course, uh, give us an update on these reports and also a lot of progress that is made in Europe. And uh, I mean, let's hope that we will be able to fix CRA. Uh, thanks for all those insights and I would love to chat with you again. Thank you.
Thanks, Swap. Thanks for uh, helping us amplify our, uh, our core messaging. I really appreciate the opportunity.